and welcome to the last lesson in the series on light and lenses. In our previous lesson, Gugu and Pindi went on a very exciting field trip to find out how combinations of lenses are used in everyday optical instruments. They looked at microscopes, binoculars and refracting telescopes. We ended off that lesson by looking at some of the problems or limitations that engineers encountered when building very large refracting telescopes. In today's lesson, we are going to have a look at how engineers and physicists solve these problems to enable us to see even further into space. As you know, mirrors are also optical devices capable of forming enlarged and diminished images. Now, in the latter part of the 19th century, new technology enabled us to create much larger mirrors than was previously possible. And this opened up a whole new world of possibilities for telescope builders. They decided to replace the converging lenses of refracting telescopes with converging mirrors to build a new kind of telescope called a reflecting telescope. During the rest of this lesson, we will find out how these reflecting telescopes work. By the end of today's lesson, you should be able to describe how images are formed in reflecting telescopes and evaluate what impact the SALT project has had on South Africa. Firstly, let's look more closely at how images form in curved mirrors. In the first lesson of the series, we saw that a mirror forms an image by reflecting light off its surface. We found that a concave or shaving mirror formed an image that was enlarged, but that in a convex mirror, like the rear view mirror of a car, the image was diminished. Let's go over to Aaron in the lab to see whether curved mirrors also form images with these characteristics. I have a couple of curved mirrors here, and these mirrors are a little hollow in the middle. Now you guys should remember that these type of mirrors are called concave mirrors. Now previously you saw that this type of mirror gives an enlarged virtual image. But just look at this. Do you see that just like a converging lens, this mirror converges and focuses light rays at a point? Now have a look what happens when I use this mirror to reflect light coming from this light box. It converges light rays to a focus, forming a real inverted and diminished image like this. So where does the virtual and large image that we saw in the first lesson come from? You may be asking. Well, just like with all the converging lenses, it has everything to do with the position of the object. If the object is far away, the image is small, upside down, and can be seen on a screen. As the object gets closer to the mirror, the image gets bigger but still stays upside down and real. Can you think of what happens when an object is moved to a position between the focal point and the mirror? Now again, remember what happened with the converging lens in this case. As you can see, the image is now bigger, enlarged or magnified, upright and virtual. In other words, it can no longer be cast onto a screen and we have to look into the mirror to see it. Hmm, not pretty, hey? When a converging lens produces this type of image, we call it a magnifying glass. Now, a mirror producing this type of image is often called a shaving mirror. Let's summarize. We have just seen that just like a converging lens, a converging mirror forms a small, inverted, real image as long as the object is placed between infinity and f. As soon as the object is placed between f and the lens, both the converging lens and mirror form an enlarged virtual image that can only be observed through the device. Now, this mirror is called a convex or a diverging mirror. The middle part here bulges out slightly. And again, we're going to compare this mirror with a diverging lens. No matter what position of the object is, the image is always virtual, upright and diminished, or smaller than the object. This type of mirror is commonly used as a rear view mirror in a car or at dangerous and sharp turns in parking lots. It enables drivers to see what's going on behind them and even around the corners. 
Now that we have seen how mirrors form images, let's concentrate on how mirrors have improved telescopic design. There are three major problems with refracting telescopes. Firstly, there are chromatic aberrations that we discussed in our previous lesson. Remember, this occurred because white light is made up of different wavelengths that refract at different angles when passing through a lens. Secondly, lenses have to have been made from materials that have almost uniform optical density and both sides of the lens need to be cut and polished to perfection to get a decent image. As you can imagine, this is a very difficult and time-consuming process. Lastly, lenses can only be supported at their edges. This means that the shape of very large lenses actually distort under their own weight due to the force of gravity. Can you think of how using mirrors instead of lenses in a telescope can address these problems? Well, in the first place, mirrors have only one surface that has to be ground into the correct shape. And because mirrors reflect light, there is no change in wave speed and therefore no chance of chromatic aberrations. Also, a mirror can be supported along its full back surface, which means that you can have much larger mirrors as objective optical elements. The simplest design for reflecting telescope is known as the Newtonian reflector. In this telescope, the convex objective lens is replaced by a concave mirror. This is called the primary mirror. Remember, concave mirrors also converge light to a focus as convex lenses do. A secondary plane mirror is put in front of the primary mirror at an angle of 45 degrees. This mirror redirects the light that is reflected and focused by the primary mirror to an eyepiece on the side of the telescope tube. The image formed by a Newtonian reflector is a real inverted image. As I've said, this is an incredibly simple design and as a matter of fact, you will find that a lot of amateur astronomers design and build their own Newtonian telescopes from all sorts of everyday materials. Most professionally built telescopes today, however, have a mix of refractor and reflector elements in their design and are called compound or catadioptric telescopes. The most popular design for this type of compound telescope is the Schmidt Cassegrain Focus. In this design, a primary mirror that may be spherical or parabolic in shape reflects light to a secondary convex mirror that reflects the light right back through a hole in the primary mirror to a focus behind the primary mirror. It also includes a lens that is called a corrector plate. This is situated behind the secondary mirror and keeps the tube and optical elements clean as well as corrects any spherical aberration. Spherical aberrations are a distortion of the shape of images formed of far-off objects in a spherical mirror. Practically, the light striking the inner part of the mirror focuses further away from the mirror than light striking the outer parts of the mirror. Because the light path is folded in the schmidt cassegrain design, it also allows for quite a compact telescope without sacrificing magnification. By now, you should have a pretty good idea of how mirrors, lenses and a combination of the two are used in telescopes. I'm also sure that you're beginning to understand that the primary function of telescopes is light gathering. For this reason, almost every large telescope currently in existence or that is being planned include mirrors in their design. These telescopes can have single mirrors with diameters of up to 8 meters across. Remember, this is because one of the important advantages to using mirrors over lenses is that they can be supported from behind. But this was not enough for astronomers who wanted to see even further into space. Nowadays, modern telescopes use many small mirrors to make up even larger mirrors, up to 11 meters across. In fact, South Africa has one of the most up-to-date, cutting-edge telescopes that use a multiple mirror alignment. 
South Africa has recently completed building one of the largest telescopes in the world, called the Southern African Large Telescope, or SALT for short. SALT has a mirror that is 11 meters across and is made up of 91 elements or segments, each one meter across. They're hexagonal in shape so that they all interlock. Because of its size and complexity, it needs some very accurate systems to make sure all the segments or elements point in the same direction at the same time. That sounds incredible, doesn't it? In fact, if you consider just how difficult it is to align only two mirrors, it seems almost impossible to imagine trying to do it for 91 mirrors. Fortunately, modern technology and computers help them. To round up today's lesson, here's a brief look at SALT. Today, the South African Astronomical Observatory still operates from the old Royal Observatory headquarters in Cape Town, but the modern telescopes have relocated 400 kilometers north to a mountaintop near the Karoo village of Sutherland. On this mountaintop, manned research telescopes explore the cosmos every clear night. Monitoring black holes, surveying distant stars and galaxies or giant explosions in space. Until 2005, the 1.9 meter was the biggest research telescope in Southern Africa researching black holes, pulses, stars and galaxies. But it is now dwarfed by the Southern African Large Telescope, also known as SALT. SALT, an international endeavor with partners from the UK, Germany, Poland, America and New Zealand, has 91 one-meter mirrors in a giant array 11 meters across, making it the largest single optical telescope in the Southern Hemisphere. SALT's cameras can record images as faint as a candle on the moon. Its sophisticated instruments can dissect light from distant stars and galaxies, answering questions such as, what was the universe like when the first stars were formed? How are stars born? How do they work? And how do they die? What kinds of planets form around other suns? SALT is well placed to explore the universe for decades to come, while inspiring generations of Africans to aspire to the stars. World-class science is happening in Southern Africa. And just as the building of SALT stretched the capabilities of South African industry, using SALT will surely inspire the next generation of scientists engineers and scholars who will come home to SALT, South Africa's giant eye, probing the secrets of the cosmos. Well, that's it for today's lesson. In fact, that's it for the series. I hope you found it as interesting as I have. If you'd like to do a little more research on SALT, try today's task. Write a report in which you consider the advantages and disadvantages for South Africa of being involved in a project such as SALT. Until we meet again, goodbye and enjoy your physics. Yeah.